Well, welcome. This is our last evening of this semester, the fall semester, and hopefully you've learned a lot and we've given you useful information. And so Gary and I are going to share tonight and I'll take half the time and then he gets the other half and then we'll both answer questions along the way. Let me pray before we get started. Father, uh, it's a privilege to use our gifts, both Gary and I, to teach, and uh, hopefully we've, we've made an impact uh, in that each person here will have learned more about what they believe and, and why they believe it, and, and then some key facts about other beliefs so we can make a difference in their lives. So help us, guide us, and, and uh, help us to apply this truth with our friends, relatives, and neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight, the World Mission Society Church of God. That's a lot to say, you know, all in one uh, breath. So what sort of contact have I had with the World Mission Society Church of God? Well, I have a website, the Biblical Worldview Academy, and I got a comment from a, a young, well, I can't say young lady, I don't even know her age, but a lady by the name of Missy. And Missy complained about the fact that Jehovah Witnesses don't know how to study their Bibles. And she gave some examples of, of verses that she shared, and it was really evident she didn't know how to study her Bible either. So uh, I found out later that she was from the World Mission Society Church of God. And they're just taught verses. They're not taught context. They're not taught why books are written for what reason. They're just given by their, their organization. They're, they're given verses to memorize. And it's like a single year's worth of content, and then you keep repeating it. You don't get new content. They just repeat it over and over again. As far as verses to memorize, the, the Jehovah Witnesses do very similar things. They train their people by using single verses. Most of them are taken out of context. And they warn their people. In fact, both groups warn their people, don't go to other sources. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses say, don't read the Bible on your own. Use our materials. Because if you read the Bible on your, on your own, in two years you'll be in darkness which means you'll leave the organization, is, is what they're implying. Well, this conversation with Miss, Missy lasted a few months, and we went back and forth, and, and finally it ended. And about the time it ended, and I had done all this re research on this church group, Two ladies come to my door about two weeks later. It's like, okay, Lord, you were preparing me for this visit. And so these, these two young ladies try to make a case that there is a mother God. And it didn't take me long to just unravel their, their case. And I came on strong. Why did I come on strong? Well, I thought this was going to be a one-time deal. I never thought that, that, just like with my Jehovah Witness friends and my Mormon friends, I always try to go long term. But here, I hit them hard. Now, not nasty, but with good scriptures. I knew their beliefs because I had studied it because of the email conversations I'd had with Missy. And they said they'd be back. And I looked at Peg after they left and I said, no way. <laughs> They're not coming back. I, I hit them too hard. But the, the one thing I can say is they left with stones in their shoes. They limped out of there. And that's a good thing. I want them to think about their, their beliefs, their verses, and, th and this sort of thing. Well, let's talk about their church, at least the size of their church. This is what it can look like. It started with one. In 1964, this church started... With one church, now they have 7,500 and about 3.3 to 3.5 million members worldwide. You'll notice the ladies have to have head coverings, and they're separated from the guys. You know, it's, 
it's a very interesting uh, uh, belief system. Oh, this is our local. <laughs> this is, just the other day I drove by, I had to take a picture of this so I could show you on the corner of Ash and El Norte is a World Mission Society Church of God. So ma many of you pass it all the time and didn't realize that, uh, but it's there. They took that church over from, a, from another church. All right, so here's what you're going to learn, how the religion started, and then we're going to talk about some of their doctrines. And what are the biblical doctrines that they abuse? So, a little bit of background, and, and I will apologize if I mispronounce South Korean names, because <laughs> that's where it started. And uh, so, it's, it was founded by An Song Hong in South Korea in 1964, and he was raised a Buddhist. But then he started attending a Seventh-day Adventist church. We had a discussion before we started about the Seventh-day Adventist church. He starts attending that church, and he gets baptized there. And married in 58 and fathered four children. But in 62, he gets kicked out. 1962, he gets kicked out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I didn't research why. All I know is he got booted. What would you do to get, get kicked out? Probably teach false doctrines by the Seventh-day Adventist church standards. And then, two years later, he started a, a church called the Witnesses of Jesus Church of God. So there's his first attempt. This is the early church. And they get started, and then he dies. He dies much earlier than they had planned. This, it was totally unexpected. They had all these different plans. And what happened was the church then splits into two major groups. I think it split into three, but uh, there, there were two major groups. One was called the New Covenant Passover Church of God. And this church included his wife and his four children and the son function as the leader. And I, as far as I know, they are still, still functioning as a church, this other group. Night is the other split, and that's the World Mission Society Church of God. Uh, the current pastor leader of that church in South Korea is Kim Ju Sheol. Sheol, I guess uh, that's the best I can come, come with that. Kim is the pastor there. And An Shang Hong's spiritual wife, Zhang Jija, became part of this group. So his, his spiritual wife, now what is a spiritual wife? Some say it was a mistress, okay, on the side. But other websites called her his uh, spiritual wife. But members regard her as, the, as God the mother that has come from heaven. Wow, that's a, that's a heavy label to be put on you. And after his death in 85, the members now ch teach that An Song Hong is the second coming of Christ. Second coming. Keep that in mind. And he is not only Jesus Christ, he is also the Father and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we'll, we'll unpack that when we talk about uh, the, their belief on the Trinity. So that'll, that'll come into play. But he is Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Now, they have ways of advertising their group. You say, boy, they have all these whack beliefs. Who would believe in that? Well, they have ways to advertise their church. And the, one of the best ways they do it is by doing good works, by doing projects. Uh, I went on the internet and Here's there, there's the World, World Mission Society Church of God is supporting a blood drive, their members. Uh, you, you have a cleanup campaign the church supported. These are good things. Don't get me wrong. Don't, these are all good things, but this is how they advertise their church. We are the church of action. We do these excellent good works, 
come alongside and then we'll teach you the rest. This is how they advertise. And again, here's some more opportunities for people to get involved in a park cleanup. All good stuff, but it's the way they pretty much promote themselves. In fact, they, in some ways, I think they brag about it. That look at us, we do all this, what do you do? Yes, as Tracy said, that uh, they, they're almost boasting about their, their good deeds and the awards that they get. All right, so that's the background on the church, where it came from. Now let's shift, since this is a, a short session, uh, to four false doctrines and the biblical truth that goes along with them. The first thing they do is they reject the Trinity, even though they claim to believe in the Trinity. And, but they reject the traditional definition of one God subsisting in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal. And according to the biblical definition, and I've made this case over the weeks, that if the Trinity is true, that puts them outside of Christianity. They're not a Christian group, even though they claim to be. In fact, they are modalists. And we're going to talk about modalism in just a second. Biblical Unitarians are modalists. So here's what modalism teaches. It preserves the one God. This is crucial. The Bible teaches over and over and over again at least 28 verses that directly teach there's only one God. Modalism preserves that. That's what they're attempting to do, is to preserve that. But the way they preserve it in the three persons is they say that God manifests himself in different modes at different times. So let's look at what the modes are. In the Old Testament, and I'm going to use these hats to uh, distinguish, this is the father hat, Callaway. <laughs> and this is, during the Old Testament, you have the father. You don't have the son or the Holy Spirit aren't around only the Father, it's in the, the Father age or the Father mode. Then the incarnation happens. And Jesus is born. And we end up with the New Testament. We end up with the Jesus mode. And Jesus does his ministry. See, the one God is still preserved. But there's no Father and there's no Holy Spirit. There's just the Son ministering during this time period. Then Jesus dies on the cross, resurrects, ascends into heaven, and the last one is the Holy Spirit mode during the church age. So those are the three modes. Father mode in, in the Old Testament, Jesus mode when he's born and ministers and then dies on the cross and resurrects and ascends into heaven. And then today we have the Holy Spirit mode. There is no, the Father or Son are not around. One person at a time. See, we believe in one God subsisting in three persons. They have one God in the one person mode at a time. Does that make sense? Do the hats, I hope the hats help. They're kind of fun because we're going to look at that in a second. Again, one person or one mode at a time. Now, Missy wrote this to me. She said, there was a time when people prayed to Jehovah. This was the age of the Father. Then came the age of the Son. This is Jesus. Then came the age of the Holy Spirit. Totally revealing that she's, she's a modalist. Later, she wrote this. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. I would agree. But then he, she, she goes into this. She says, he gave us science and nature to realize this. H2O, is, or water, is solid, liquid, and gas. They're one mode at a time. You can have ice as, the, as one mode. You can have water as a mode. And you can have steam as a mode. But they're all at separate times. They're all modes, and that's how they describe 
God is. God is a single being in, in separate modes. The Father mode, the Son mode, and the Holy Spirit mode. She also compared it to a caterpillar, a, a pupa, and a butterfly. Now, modalism was rejected in the second century as a, as a heresy. You look in church history, and modalism was the first one to go. Arianism followed a little bit later. Now, what to share? What do you share with a modalist? Here's, here's the key. Any verse where there's more than one divine person together at the same time. Any time in the scripture you have the Son and the Holy Spirit together, the Father and the Son together, any time they're together, you're going to refute a modalist. So when are they together? Luke 22, 42, Jesus is praying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. How many wills? There's two wills. That's not possible in modalism. You can't have two persons interacting, two persons at one time, two wills. Here's another one. This is, this is even better. Uh, Matthew 3, 16 and 17, at the baptism of Jesus. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and beheld the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and light, lighting on heaven said, Oh, lighting, lighting on him, verse 17, and behold, a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How many persons? Vince indicated three, and he's right. We have Jesus, we have the Spirit, and the voice is the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are there all at the same time. I was trying to picture that. You know, you had uh, Jesus gets baptized, then the Holy Spirit appears as a dove, and then the Father says, this, this is my son, my beloved son, whom, whom I am well pleased. So he got to shift all these different modes at the same time. This is why modalism is, is false. You can't have all three present at the same time. And... That means the World Mission Society, Church of God, follows the false god. So that's the first false doctrine. Now uh, the second is talking about Jesus Christ. They said that An Song Hong is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that he came secretly. He came secretly. Well, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back visibly. It is not going to be a secret second coming. In Matthew 24, verses 23 and 23, 23 and 24, Jesus talks about false Christs and prophets. And then he addresses the religious leaders and he says this. So if they say to you, or he told the people this, if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be like lightning, and it's going to shine as far as the west, from the east to the west. In fact, Jesus told Caiaphas, what did Jesus say to Caiaphas? He said that he was going to come on the clouds of heaven. Jesus will not come secretly. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a, a loud shout that's going to be proclaiming that Jesus is coming and it's going to be visible. And as I said, he told Caiaphas this in Matthew 26, that he'd come on the clouds of heaven. So, An Song Hung cannot be Jesus Christ. All right, so we've gone through the Trinity, we've talked about Jesus, let's talk about salvation. How are they saved? Uh, by believing in the name of Jehovah, Jesus, and An Song Hung. That's how you are saved. And you must be baptized by them. So what do we say about that? Well, we know An Song Hung is not 
a name that we're going to be saved by. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says we are saved by grace, by grace alone and faith alone, not by works. And baptism, you can, you can say, and we've said it before, baptism can be considered a work. And in Acts chapter 10 is the story of Cornelius, and he gets saved. He and his men get saved. They're all Gentiles. They get saved, and then they're baptized. So baptism cannot be attached to salvation. Now, here's some other things they say about being saved. You must worship with them on the Sabbath. Every week, you've got to be there or you're not going to be saved. You must celebrate Passover and the other feasts or you're not going to be saved. Here's a picture of the assembly of Passover. They make a big deal out of Passover, and it is tied to your salvation. This is an extremely controlling group. They want to control your life. And let's go to Mother God now. So we've done, we've done the Trinity, Jesus, salvation. Now let's talk about Mother God. And you must believe and worship Zhang Gilha as Mother God or you're not saved. And there she is. Nah, she looks like a nice lady and nothing against her. But this is their belief that you have to worship her as Mother God or you're not going to be saved. Uh, Missy wrote this. When Jesus walked the earth, nobody knew we had a father in heaven. It was a new thing. <laughs> when An Song Hung walked the earth, nobody knew we had a mother in heaven. This, too, was, was a new thing. Well, how new was it? Well, God was speaking to uh, David about Solomon. He told him that you're not going to build my temple because you're a warrior and your son. It's going to be your offspring that's going to resurrect the temple and, and rebuild the temple. And he says this in 2 Samuel 7, 13. He shall build a house for my name, that's Solomon. It's going to be Solomon shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now I got to admit, it, this father-son relationship in the Old Testament is not as prominent as it is in the New Testament. But it, it wasn't a new thing. At least this passage says it's not a new thing that there was a father in heaven. Yet there's zero teaching in the Old Testament or New Testament about Mother God. So she makes this claim it was new, and then she says that the Mother God was new, but there's nothing. There's no teaching on Mother God, zero. And I want to say to her, hey, Mother, hey, Missy, Mother God is not a new thing. It's a nothing, no thing. <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> it's a no thing, not a not a new thing. The two ladies at my door tried to make the case. And I went online to find the two passages they, they shared with me that we could look at them. Again, this is from the official website. They used 2 Corinthians 6.18. I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And they say children and fathers cannot exist without mothers. And they're making their case using an analogy. They say that God is our father, father and he considers us his children. This implies that there must be a heavenly mother. But yet nothing is mentioned. There's no mention of a mother God. And again, it's a case by analogy. Analogies are not arguments. They can support an argument, but what's your argument? There is none. There was no argument. It was just a story. I call them stories. That angers a few people when I say that's a nice story, but what, what do you, what's your argument? And they, they get a little riled, so i got to be careful saying that. And here's the second one they like to use. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. The, but Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. They say heavenly Jerusalem is our mother. Our, ref our refers to God's children. What's the problem with this? Well, again, there's no reference to Mother God. Zero. 
And it's talking about the new and the Mosaic covenants. If you read it in context, that's what this whole thing is about. It's not about Mother God. Hagar represents slavery. Sarah represents freedom. This is what it's all about. In fact, Paul writes in Galatians 5.1, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So it's freedom versus slavery, nothing about Mother God. Either we have freedom in Christ or we are slaves to the law. That's what he's teaching there. In fact, he uses Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai represents bondage. And heavenly Jerusalem represents freedom. We are free to serve God. And Galatians 4.26, again, has nothing to do in context with Mother God. And remember, (laughs) never read a Bible verse. That's what they they violate like crazy. And you can't have Mother God if there's only one God. And And over and over again, like I said, there's at least 28 verses that say there is only one God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. There is no mother God. <laughs> Mom fits in there somewhere. You do have your modalism, you have your your trinity, but then they throw mom in there. The Bible does mention heavenly mother. And if we look at it in, in Jeremiah 7 and 44, it's not good news. Heavenly mother is an idol. And God hated this idol worship. And it was blasphemy what was happening in, in Jeremiah. And so the only passage that talks about Heavenly Mother is talking about idol worship, false worship. And so that group is under God's judgment. And we are to reject their teaching. This is from them, Mother who gives eternal life. So let me wrap up real quick. Modalism was a second century heresy. The Trinity is the solution. It's not a problem. If you understand the Trinity, it solves the problems of the Scripture. Modalism doesn't. You can't have two divine persons at the same time. An Song Hong is not the second coming of Christ. Remember, the second coming of Christ is going to be visible. It's not going to be secret. Salvation is not through An Song Hong and all those other things. And baptism does not save you. And Mother God is not biblical. The only mention is a negative mention.